He's Jim Stewart, I'm Rick Collins, and this is Off the Bench. Today we've got a college basketball uh, review. Last night we had a couple of huge games. Uh, Texas Legends season preview, they're already started, but we're going to jump in here at the beginning of the season before they get too deep. NBA news, Mavs update, we've got a college football playoff rankings update, a big one after this crazy last weekend that we talked about. And then Tyler Kernan, U.S. soccer update. Yeah, that, actually, that'll be tomorrow. We're Will that, that be up that, tomorrow? That, we're doing that oh. tomorrow. But the, I wanted, I, I wanted want an update for soccer. Yeah, I know, and last night's game was interesting, but we'll find out more about that tomorrow. But a big update on the LiAngelo Ball story. Well, we call it the LiAngelo Ball story. Really, it should just be called... Ball story. The Ball, ball in a China uh, shop story. Ball, along with Jalen Hill and Cody Ryland, were suspended indefinitely after their theft and um, uh, let's, let's say uh, involvement in crime in China. International incident, baby. Yes, an international incident. I, I just, I, I, I don't I want think to we talk need to dive, about We'll much. dive into that tomorrow. We'll do a bunch of research yes. and make a big deal of it tomorrow. But today we, we've got to make we a big deal much college football. about college football. The rankings came out last night. It shook up the college football world like we thought it would. Alabama didn't really move from their perch on the top. No, Georgia slipped, and so Alabama just yep. slid right into that And then it was Clemson, Miami, Oklahoma, and Wisconsin that that finish out the playoffs and then have that bubble team yep. at number five. Yeah, and Auburn five. and Georgia, I think, still have a shot, but it, it's going to take massive tumbling from other teams. It's going to take Auburn beating Alabama. It's going to take Georgia winning the SEC championship yes. game, winning out, winning that game. It's going to take, uh, you know, an Oklahoma loss. It's going to take Miami losing. It's going to take Clemson losing another game. Uh, there's a lot that has to go wrong for Auburn and Georgia to have a shot. But outside of these six the teams, everybody play. else is out. Everybody else is out. There, there's too many teams outside that with two losses. One of the things that I'm sad about is that a team like UCF that is undefeated so far this season, they'll probably go undefeated and win the American Athletic Conference and Memphis, who's only lost one game on the year, they do not have a shot at getting into the college football. Are you football only cheering playoff. about them because SMU's in that conference? No, it, I, I just to me it's. But they're not a power five. Outside conference. the power five conference, yes. you cannot get in. You can't. No matter how many losses the top teams have, you cannot get into the championship. If Alabama was number one with three losses, they would still be number one over an undefeated UCF. They would still be. They Five cons- or six teams ahead of UCF. But they consider the competition no less. They can, you know, and, the, and not that I agree. I think that they should base each team individually on merit. Well, maybe they but need if you to go look to a at Power Five should be in the rankings. Everybody else should have their own rankings and play in their own bowl playoff system. I don't know. Uh, maybe I... I this, is, this looks bad because what does a UCF coach do? What can he do to get into college football? Uh, you know what he, he does? Do he anything. schedules games with bigger teams. Doesn't he, matter. A schedule in Oklahoma, schedule in Ohio State, Oregon, someone. And if they start winning those games or make it close, then those teams start creeping up. The problem is, is that these, these smaller schools in unknown d- divisions or conferences, they stay in their lane. Yeah. SMU doesn't ever go against big schools because, well, they don't do it because they know they'll get blown out. Yeah. But, you know, the biggest team that, that uh, SMU played this year was UNT. Yeah. And UNT's not a huge power no. school. They need to start going outside of their comfort zone and start scheduling some of these bigger, stronger Power 5 teams because what will happen then, even though it's a risk for their undefeated season, you get rewarded for that. That's how TCU got up there. Yeah. Think about it. TCU was nobody. Yeah, they were, they were not a Power Five team. They weren't even. They weren't in the Big Twelve. This is before the Big Twelve when Gary Patterson got there, and he said, "We're going to make that next step because we're going to start playing against those teams." Yes, and that is the way they get out of it. I'm not going to say "woe is me" when all they do is play other SMU's, other you know, Memphis's, you know, Memphis's and, and stuff, because those South teams will Florida. never be able to compete. Just like our conversation at lunch, where. Alabama couldn't even play against the Browns. Yeah. They couldn't. But if they start attempting and all that stuff, then you might give them more recognition. Now, diving back in, I think this lineup will be shaken up again once or even possibly twice by the, by the time that this is locked up. Yeah. Because Auburn has a real chance. At beating Alabama. At beating I mean, Alabama. Especially after the way they played against Georgia. Holy cow. Yeah. 
They, it was I, crazy. Nobody saw that one coming. But is, here's my question. Is Alabama king of the hill, or is it Humpty Dumpty getting ready to have his fall? That's the real question. I don't think they're about to fall. I think Alabama's going to win, but... As the season goes on, it's going to get less and less convincing that they're number one. Yeah, a strange thing this happened. Game, this game will be close. Yes, the strange thing, the strangest thing happened on Saturday was that as soon as all of that Auburn stuff happened, people immediately started paying attention to Alabama again. Yeah. This whole season, no one paid attention to Alabama because they were like, "Well, Alabama's just going to win through. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to struggle with anybody." These injuries have forced the attention back onto Alabama. They lost their entire linebacking core um, with season-ending injuries. Yes, the middle linebacker went out this last weekend against Mississippi State, and before that, their two outside linebackers had gone out. So they're in real trouble defensively when you're when that um, second level is is you know second third team players they're running the defense they're just making decisions about where defensive ends are they're also up stopping the gaps that do appear yes. it doesn't matter how dominant your front four and are you, you face an auburn team that can run the ball i, I think it's going to be a problem for alabama's defense i now i don't know that they lose you still have a great offense and you have a lot of weapons and your defensive line's still good but not having those guys not having fitzpatrick there uh you know basically taking whoever is the top receiver out of the game. There, there are problems on this Alabama defense. I don't know that it shows up this weekend but or next weekend, but I think and is, they play Mercer this weekend, so it's not going to show up this weekend. <laughs> but next weekend, they, they plan the it shows up. easiest schedule but man, ever. Talk about playoff time. It's a serious issue. Well, here's the thing. As soon as Miami-Notre Dame happened, all of the attention now turned to Alabama at center stage because they do look at the, okay, they played... La, uh, Louisiana Lafayette, Mercer, yeah. Mississippi State. Was Miami going to leapfrog everybody yes. with this? But what now happens is, is Miami, with warts and all, was able to beat Notre Dame, who everybody thought was a more complete team yes. than obviously they were. So now these questions are being asked of Alabama. Are you a complete team? How do you think it's going to happen with these linebackers? And no matter how much Nick Saban goes, we're fine, we're fine, we'll be good. You can't replace an entire linebacking core with backups that don't have the reps. Yeah, and I think, I think we're going to see that they'll finish out the season fine. I think they still end up in the number one spot. But whoever ends up at number four has a really good shot in this playoff so, to get a win. Let's talk about number two. Is Miami deserving of the number two spot? They beat Notre Dame, but does that mean they get to jump over everybody? Because outside of Notre Dame... They haven't had the strongest schedule. No, and now they've played in the ACC. They haven't played Clemson. So, you know, there's still teams that, even in their own conference, they haven't had to play yet that are ranked. But they've had a decent schedule. The ACC is not easy, and they're undefeated. I, I think you have to, if they're in a power five, they're undefeated. I think they deserve a jump to the number two. But... The question would be, before they get to play Clemson, do they deserve that jump? Yes. And I think the Clemson game will show. If they win against Clemson, they will have deserved that number two. But I think it, you could have said, I would have been okay had they put Clemson at number two, Oklahoma at number three, and Miami at number four. I would have been fine with that because yeah. I would have said, look, they need to go beat Clemson before you can yes. break them above Clemson. Oh, with above, yes, yeah, and above Oklahoma. And above Oklahoma. But I think they leapfrog Oklahoma for sure if they beat Clemson. So, if we looked at right today, if we based the rankings off of, let's say, Vegas odds, Vegas does have Miami above Clemson yeah. because they're undefeated. But last time I checked, it wasn't a criteria in the committee's decision-making of the rankings to introduce or to verify where the team should be ranked based on Vegas odds, because last time I checked, Clemson has a loss. Yes. But they also played a bunch of teams that have been ranked. Yes, they've played a Miami schedule. has not. They they've walked into a, couple a of game. ranked teams, including Notre Dame, which was a top four team. So they've played good teams. Clemson's average overall in terms of teams that they've played against is much more challenging than what Miami's played. Yeah, because Clemson played a number six Auburn. Yeah, which is there for oh, their one loss at number six, right? Yeah. So that's why they're up ranked as high as they right. are. Absolutely. Miami played a number eight over uh, Notre Dame. You know, when when that was what their ranking was 
throughout the season until they beat who they did to get to number two or number three. So the question is, is, is Notre Dame, has their ranking been inflated over the last couple weeks? Or do you think they are a number three team so that when Miami beats them that they are able to leapfrog all the people they have? I think, they're, I think you could organize those three teams in any, any way you wanted to. I think you know, Miami deserves to be a number two only because they're undefeated. Yes. In my opinion. Not, not, not based, not based, based on, on, schedule. on schedule. Now, they still have Clemson left. So Last that's time I checked, U- US, uh, UCF was un- undefeated now. But UCF <laughs> is not in the Power Five. So UCF, unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Um, let's look at OU versus Clemson and the rankings drama. So I think Clemson does deserve to be above OU, but I think it's millimeters. You're really talking about you could easily flip-flop these two teams. They both played hard schedules. The Big 12 and ACC are probably fairly comparable this year. Maybe the Big 12 is slightly better, but it's really, I mean, apples and apples. I think both of these conferences are the weak, well, over the past five years have probably been the weakest conferences. The Pac-12, you could say, is maybe the weakest conference uh, overall. But this year, there are a lot of teams in both of those conferences that have struggled. ACC has had more ranked teams over the course of the year. In, tw- in the top the, 25. But in the top 25, but the Big 12 has had more you know, three or four teams in the top 10, top 15. So I think it's fairly even, and I think you could go either way, but I think Clemson's wins against Auburn, against NC State, put them above Oklahoma. But I'm sorry, I don't think NC State came anywhere close to where TCU and OC- oh, OSU, either OSU, has been this year on the ranking list. NC State never even broke the top 15. Well, to me, sh- Alab- uh, Auburn beating Georgia... Is it because Georgia it's a rivalry? ...shows how much better Auburn is. Yeah, but, but also, if you think about it, my, Clemson's Auburn, one, Auburn, well, Clemson's Auburn one loss. Auburn is conference. But Clemson's Clemson. one loss is to Notre Dame. Who did... Who and did, Notre Dame got did, smashed. So Oklahoma beat OSU. I, I, think, I think we're... Iowa State, yeah. they lost to Iowa State, but Iowa State That's then the, went yeah. and, play, and beat o- OSU and TCU. I think what the, what the committee is telling us is they believe that the ACC is better than the Big 12. And I don't know that that's completely true. That's why I say literally there are millimeters yeah. between and the that, two teams. And that's the issue, even. and we're never going to be able to get rid of the bias There's that you always going to be a bias. I mean, I don't know what you and want. And the SEC and the ACC will always get biased. This toward- is like Shereen with A&M. Yes. Until Oklahoma's number one, you will not be happy. No. And same with A&M. Until A&M leaves the SEC, the SEC will be one of the most powerful conferences. It doesn't matter what in terms they of money. Th- yes. No, well, no, but in the minds of people who are from the SEC or believe that Alabama is untouchable and they believe that Clemson without Deshaun, uh, Deshaun Watson is untouchable, that they think that they're the same team without their starting quarterback, yeah. which they aren't. Yeah. And in in a conference that obviously, obviously is weak compared to what, uh, let's, let's, just, let's just be honest, compared to the Big Ten and the Big 12. There are not as many big powerhouse teams this year in those two divisions are, as there are in the Big Ten and the Big 12. But the problem is, SEC will constantly get Alabama in the top four every year as long as Nick Saban's there because Nick Saban has five rings well, or whatever Well, this is like us talking about Sergei Zuboff and why he isn't in the NHL Hall of Fame. And it's because he's not Canadian and there's a huge bias that you have to be Canadian to be a great hockey player. So I, I think there's always going to be a bias in college football, no matter how we're picking these teams. I think this is the best we've seen so far. I think those four teams are the best teams in the country. You look at five and six and you say, they've been great. But Wisconsin's undefeated, but they haven't played anybody. And then looking at Auburn, yes, they've won big games, but then they lost to Clemson. So are they really as good as everybody says they are? And and this is going to be, we're coming to a hard break, but but the crazy part is all these strings, if you ever do just sit down and listen to some of these, these college football analysts talk, these strings they pull out, well... Well, Clemson lost uh, to Notre Dame, who lost to Miami, who lost to this, who lost to that. So that means, because these two teams lost to different teams, that means you're this bad. How? Well, that's why the college football rankings should not go into effect until probably about this time of year. Yes. Because those, you know, last eight, nine weeks of rankings, 
Those just confuse everything. They muddy the waters. <laughs> they make it more confusing. Like, Wait a minute, but that team was here then. And I think it should be based on strength of schedule. That's it as soon as the first rankings come out. Then it's based on well, who Oklahoma you play. Well, be bottom of the pile, so. <laughs> <laughs> and next we got Mavs update, and then we'll get into more NBA, and then more basketball, and more basketball, and more. We've got co we're all basketball today outside of this college football rankings. Uh, next, let's talk Dennis Smith Jr. We're so excited to invite you to our Stacy Furniture Anniversary Sale. Save today on Stacy's outstanding selection, up to 50% off select items throughout the store. Now's the time to buy that new bedroom, living room, or dining room suit. You can't beat these prices anywhere. Name brands like Bernhardt, Hooker, Universal, and Cheryl. All on sale today. It's Stacy's Anniversary Sale only happens once a year. Shop Stacy's today or visit us online at stacyfurniture.com. Remember, when you're shopping at Stacy's, you're shopping with family. And we're back with Dennis Smith Jr. Oh wait, no, he's not in the studio. No, but he's not. He has been on the court, and that is what we need from our point guard this year. The two, two of the three point guards drafted before him have not really seen the court at all this season. Um, you know, the Knicks and even LeBron called out the Knicks and said they missed out on Dennis Smith Jr. Did they really miss out? I mean, he played well against Cleveland the other night. But this Mavs team is not winning. No, and they, they've now gone and played Oklahoma and last night the Spurs. The Spurs were the Spurs, and they just methodically took the, the, the Mavericks apart. You and I agree and disagree on some points. I'm really optimistic of what I saw last night because I feel his offensive side is starting to come together. You know, we're starting to see that more w Russell Westbrook type of play where he's comfortable enough to explode to the bas basket with speed, and with that, uh, being able to analyze the situation near the basket and being able to explode off the ground and get to the rim. He has not shown that before. Usually he goes in with reckless abandon and almost hurts himself, and then he was hesitant for a while. So I think this game showed really his complete game. He shot threes, he, he got to the basket, he did layups, he did dunks, he did two-point shots, he did... Now, he didn't do really good at passing, right? I mean, that was your problem. Look, he's going to be a turnover machine. And that's pretty typical for a point guard coming to the NBA. That's where Lonzo Ball, who we're going to talk about a little bit, is, is different from mm -hmm. Desmond Jr. Is Lonzo Ball came in as a po po polished passer. But that's it. Mr. That's so would you rather have a polished a passer and, or would you have a score? Here's the problem I have with him. Six turnovers to two assists is not a point guard in the NBA. And the problem that the Mavs have is they're expecting him to be the starting point guard for this team, win, win or loss. And I'm okay with that. They're okay with doing that. He's going to get better. He's getting better offensively. As you said, he can score. But the problem is passing the ball, he's still got a lot of work to do. And until he, until he really commits to that side of his game, this team is not going to go anywhere. So the question is, let's just... They're only going to go as far as he can pass. For the sake of this conversation, let's go along the point of, let's say his passing doesn't get better. Would he work as a shooting guard? I think it's possible. He'd have to really improve his three-point shot. But he has a skill set that Russell Westbrook, a lot of people said Russell Westbrook should be playing a two-guard. When James Harden was there, they thought, well, those that kind would of probably would have been smart. Work together because Harden could play point and Westbrook could play shooting guard, but Westbrook demanded having the ball in his hands coming up the court. So that didn't work out. James Harden got divorced from him and left. And I, you see, if they can get Des Smith Jr. to commit to doing that, it's possible. I don't think it's going to happen. I think Rick Carlisle will find a way for Des Smith Jr. to become a better point guard. It's just going to take a lot of work, and he's just got to commit to doing everything that Rick Carlisle asks of him. And that's why I'm so excited about and less nervous, you know, because at the beginning, you knew this. I was nervous about him. I was wanting uh, Lowry Markkinen over him. Yeah. Because I saw that... that Dirk fade. And no, I, with Dennis, I saw that inability to really throttle down and know when to, to go into situations. Mm -hmm. uh, even when the ball's in his hands, you know, it almost seemed like as easy as getting around someone and dunking on him with his abilities shouldn't have been as hard as it seemed to have been for him. Right. But he is, you know, over the first, what is this, 12 games in now? 50, yeah. He has learned 
how to make, take those, he has taken massive steps offensively to be able to go from 12 points to 27 points. And, you know, I understand that could be one game. But if he continues around this 19 to 27 average between them, I think that shows that that offensive game, as great as passing is, Carla has shown that he doesn't mind running two points at the same time. Yeah. So what we do is, is we either go after... Uh, uh, the problem they have right now is they really want Wes Matthews to be the two. Uh, they no. paid him a bunch of money, and no. he's got to shoot the ball when he's and out there. And he, he, he can't dribble, and he can't shoot. pass. Uh, they, that's what they're wanting to do. The problem is that the team they have out there right now is not the team they want out there right now. And there are now rumors... The Mavericks are on the trade market. They're looking for somebody. Oh, God. I don't know who they're looking for because right now, who, who's going to trade for any of the assets that the Mavericks are going to be willing to give up? They're going to be, the Mavericks, the only thing that the Mavericks have are expiring contracts. Nerlo's Noel would be an expiring contract, but they can't trade him until after December 15th. So we have to keep that in mind. He can't be involved in any trades until December 15th. Then you've got McRoberts, uh, Withy, and Harris. McRoberts and Harris are the two players, I think, who make the most sense in terms of trying to get something back. Yes. Because McRoberts has an expiring contract. Look, he could probably either be bought out by somebody or they just let him expire at the end of the season. He sits on the bench. He doesn't play. Uh, there's going to be teams that want that because they're going to want to have cap space to try and sign somebody next year, and he's going to provide that. He's got about $4 million on the books. Okay. Then you've got Harris, who has uh, $6 million on the books. That's a lot of money expiring at the end of the year, and he's a usable asset now. He can come in and give you minutes off the bench. But I don't know what you're going to get back. The problem is, is that you're going to have to bring money back, and I don't know that there's an asset out there that you'd be willing to take a three-year contract of you know, seven or eight million on, and maybe a draft pick or some money to bring back, because they're not going to... I mean, if somebody's willing to get rid of a player three years, make it seven million a year, uh, they'd be silly. I, I, I'm looking at it this way. I think that there's a way in this next draft to be able to build a decent couple of players to bring in, right? So I think, I think we're going to definitely use our first round pick. It's going to be the top three. At this point, <laughs> at this it's point, it's be definitely going to be top so three. So you're either going to take the center out of uh, Arizona, yeah, DeAndre, or you're going to take. Uh, I forgot the player that you really like. Uh, oh, you're talking about Michael Porter Jr.? Yes. Yes, out of Missouri, if he's healthy. I mean, yeah. right now, so, he can't even get on the court. But why not convert, either get a late round first, or get one or two second round picks, bottle those well, into Well, the problem a, is money. They've got to bring money back if they're going to try to get rid of these guys. What I'm saying is, go get a two second. You can get second round picks or nothing. Get two, get two second round picks, bottle them into a package, get, and then turn it into a late first rounder, and go get Grayson Allen. Yeah, and, and yeah, we've he ta- and we've talked about Grayson. He is a passer. Yeah, and and he's not he's not going to be the point guard passer, but he's the shooting guard who's a great passer yes. who can shoot the three. He could take the ball. Sneaky, to basket. explosive, yes. sneaky, athletic. He would be a great person to put next to. Dennis and if Smith you, you know, if you look at Dennis Smith Jr. He is a very, not laid back guy, because he's, he's very hardworking, but his personality isn't raw, raw, I'm getting all worked up. Grayson Allen is that personality. Yeah. I think they would work really well together. Me, his personality reminds me of uh, Psycho, uh, Tyler, um, you know, why can I not think of his last name at the moment? Oh, uh, the, the Hansborough. Center for, uh, Hansborough from UNC. Uh, just, he has that personality, uh, which... Intense, intense, yes, intense. Yes, and Dennis Smith Jr. doesn't have that, so I think it would make a good Not combo. That, see, that's the thing i got to say, though. Dennis Smith Jr. is intense. He just doesn't let that vibe out. Yes. He is, he is, he is you know, foot to the floor, pedal to the metal all the time, or he would be. Yeah. But that personality, that, the, you know, that's what drew us to Wes Matthews outside yeah. of his defensive skill was he was that guy that got everybody else Pumped. Locker room guy too. He gets guys pumped it up before you know, he they gets even get in the games. The he's very emotional. Yes. I, I think that we've just got to be careful who we bring in because if we let go of Harris, let's say we let go of Harris. Harris, I think, unless you bring in a Grayson Allen, yeah, you can't replace that. Right now, he is a spark. Well, here's plug off here's a Harris. problem. Okay, uh, Devin Harris is 34 years old. Josh McRoberts is 30 years old, and he's been injured for basically two you years. You want to get now. rid of everybody over 30. Anybody over 30 needs to go. They've got to figure this out. Even Dirk? 
look, I think this team needs to reset. Give Dirk an opportunity to become a special assistant to Mark Cuban, right? What does that mean? He gets his coffee or something? Yeah, exactly. He talks to him. He chills with him all day, you know, hangs out. Talk. I would keep him and say, Dirk, we want to keep you. You've still got some, you know. Would he become Will Ferrell? Man's. No, make him the six-man. He's man. an assistant coach. He's a six-man, yeah. you know what I mean? But Just make him. Everything. I think he would be six-man. He pumps the team up yeah. on the bench. <laughs> I, I don't think it's bears. a terrible idea. It wrestles bears. Yeah, that would be. I would like <laughs> to see Dirk Nowitzki. Oh, quiet, everyone! Quiet. Snowflake, snowflake, snowflake. Run, <laughs> run for your life! <laughs> I think Dirk would be hilarious. It would be that. hilarious. That would be great. Uh, halftime shows with him would be good. One trade that I was able to put together that I think would work for the Mavericks. You get rid of Harris, thirty-four years old again, right? He's an expiring contract. Lots of money. We come off the books for Sacramento. Sacramento would return to us. Why is it always the same teams? Harry Giles and Bogdanovich. Bogdanovich, 24 years old. He's a good shooting guard. We need a shooting guard. He can come in. He can fill it up from three. He's a good player. He's a young asset. That's what okay. we need. And he doesn't cost us a fortune. So would you rather have him over Grayson Allen? No, but what you do is, is you still draft a Grayson Allen, but now you've got somebody who can play at the number two that Grayson Allen can learn from, split minutes, and you work Bogdanovich out of it, you work Grayson Allen into it. I okay. think that's what you want. You don't I want a Wesley Matthews who is desperate to start all the time. Because Bogdanovich is not even starting in Sacramento. He'd this be would happy be a with great minutes. opportunity for him to get minutes here. Also, Harry Giles, 19 years old. Now, he's been injured quite a bit. But How long be, has he been in the league? He'll be back in January, but his second year in the league. At 19? 19. My goodness. And so he came out right after his senior year. He was still 18. He turns 20 this year. But he has had injury concerns. But 19 years old, you can wait a couple of years on him. Think mm-hmm. Joel Embiid. Think Ben Simmons. You can wait a couple of years. Well, does he have that kind of talent? Yes. He's 6'10", 6'11". He is a, um, he's not as strong as Ben Simmons, not as great a passer. But after that, the entire skill set, he has that. So you're talking about an opportunity player. So... Hey. And if any, if any support medical staff can get him on his feet, it's the Mavs. We've got the best medical staff I think it's worth in the a league. Shot. And their salaries match up with Harris and with McRoberts. Well, look at what, you know, with the, get rid of that, that makes sense. You. That makes sense with the track record, right? Um, you know, Tyson Chandler came here because he was injury prone. And became be, it never got injured. Could end up being a Tyson Chandler if he puts on But muscle. we've heard that before. My problem is we've heard that before with Noel. But Noel, there were questions about him coming into the league. Harry Giles, there have not been questions about him in okay. terms of his work ethic and his But I thought we agreed we, we would want, if we had a choice, we would want them to go after that center from Arizona. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think you're talking about two guys that can come in. One and plays power One forward. of them who can, who can come in immediately and score for this team off the bench. Can come in and start if you need him to, if Wes Matthews needs to go bye-bye. So you could say goodbye to Wes and be okay still at shooting guard. But he's comfortable coming off the bench. Then you have a guy who could come around in December, give you minutes off the bench. Uh, basically what Mick Roberts was going to do for you, except he's 10 years younger. Okay. So for me, that's a win-win. And then you can still go. Neither of these guys are going to make that big of a difference for this team to win games. Then you still go out and get those two draft picks. Now you've try to got sign a-, a great young team with a lot of assets. One thing this Mavericks team has not had in, in the years is assets. Well, you know what? This sounds like a lot of a lot of what ifs and a lot of drama to me. This is but, the kind of trade the Mavericks need to make. I'm not saying they make this trade, but they need to do something, and this would be something they and, can do. And and speaking of drama, when we get back, we're talking NBA, and there is a lot of a drama. A lot of drama year. going on. Next. They'll test you. Try to break your will. But however loud the loudness gets, however many cheese puffs may fly, you're the driver, the one in control. Stand firm. Just wait. And move only when you hear the click that says they're buckled in for the drive. Never give up till they buckle up. So, drama has surrounded the league, even from the offseason. This was the most drama-filled offseason I've ever seen for any league. Yeah. Things jumped all over. People were moving 
rumors all over the place. I felt like I was watching Desperate Housewives. Well, it, it's now that NBA the, now that the players control the NBA, right? Yeah, they're creating the drama and their social media presence, being the largest of all the sports. I think even combined, that is creating more drama because they can go out and just say whatever comes to the top of their head. They can do it in front of the media, like LeBron did the other day. Yeah, and speaking of New York, I thought King Kong was the king of New York. Drama and intrigue has been swarming around the Knicks all season since Carmelo left. But New York Knicks center Ennis Cantor responded to Cleveland Cavaliers player and superstar LeBron James when LeBron made the statement of, I am the king of New York. Cantor comes back and goes, Mm -hmm. I'm sorry that role's been filled. With Christoph Porzingis. And Christoph, he is looking I'm like sorry. the king of New York right now. I know LeBron is probably one of the greatest players to ever play, but right now, I would take Porzingis over him in a heartbeat at, the, at, at where they are right now. If you're tra- yeah, if you're talking about trying to build a program for right the now. next 10 years, yes. I even think even so. for this year, I'd I don't take know him. that this year, maybe, maybe I would. And, 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 and LeBron is having one of his best seasons. But Porzingis, no one thought the Knicks were... They thought the Knicks were just going to fall apart and fade into purgatory. When Carmelo left, yeah. When Carmelo left, they got better. Yeah. Because they go, here, here, Porzingis, we're going to make you the boss. Okay. And he's been putting he- ho- horses' heads into people's beds. But you know that Car- he's been doing all sorts of stuff. You know that stuff. Carmelo's going, well, uh, now they're actually building a team around somebody they wouldn't do that for. You know he's going to make excuses. Like, he has no excuses now with the Oklahoma City Thunder. And they're not over 500. So I think there's big questions about, and we talked about before the season started, we've talked about it since. Oklahoma City has a problem. There are not enough balls to go around for that team. Unless you put in LaVar Ball. But when you have New York <laughs> with Kristaps, he, he is going to get the ball whenever he wants. And I'm sorry, team. but people real, need to realize the comparison to Dirk Nowitzki was way more true than people thought. Not only in style, because he's a lot more athletic, but in the style of the way he plays. He's unselfish. Yes. Willing but to not pass. his style of play. His style of play is way beyond anything dirty. Yeah, but what I meant is, is the way he plays. Not, not the actual yeah. style of scoring. I mean, right. like, he'll absorb the ball, draw two guys, all in the purpose of, of passing it yes. to someone else. Like Dirk does. Dirk is an unselfish well, superstar, and, and same with we're Porzingis. Com- we're comparing him to the former superstar in New York, Carmelo Anthony, who's the exact opposite, who is a, basically a black hole. But who's the other, the I'm sorry, who is the other superstar that does not demand the ball in his hands that the, the teammates, want? that's the thing about Porzingis. Porzingis isn't sitting there throwing fits that the ball isn't in his hand. Mm-hmm. What has happened is everybody on that team goes, yeah, he's the most skilled guy on this team. We need to get him the ball. And so when he gets the ball, he, he gets it a lot. The offense th- flows through him. He takes whatever shots he wants. But he doesn't take a shot just to take a shot. He takes his shots because he knows he's going to make mm-hmm. it. And if he doesn't, he's going to give it to someone else. LeBron can't say that. Westbrook can't say that. You know, I'm maybe Brooke Lopez, but Brooke Lopez was never a superstar. Whiteside can't say that. The only other person... That has been a superstar in the last 10, 15 years. Actually, two, sorry, two. Timmy Duncan and Dirk Nowitzki. Both those guys are not really ever considered superstars because they are not that demanding. It's all about me, player, mm-hmm. that the NBA and the, and the fans seem to yeah, love. Yeah, we're not arguing on this point. I think, I think I'm on the same page. I think he, but... But he's way more athletic. His athleticism is off the I, charts. It's I didn't know this, but Dirk came in the league as a small forward yeah. at seven foot? Yes, because of his shooting and the fact that he was a stick and he couldn't defend anybody in the post. Not that that's changed a lot, but the weight he's put on has helped at least body up to guys. Yeah, I, when he came in the league, he couldn't body up most of the small forwards in the league. So no one is arguing also that Porzingis is more talented as an athlete. Yes. The question is... Not, not quite as good a shooter, but he is on that path. Yes. He is on the Dirk Nowitzki But what he doesn't path. make up for, what he makes up for in his lack of maybe shooting compared to Dirk... The fact that he can drive by yes. almost anybody and, and dunk and over dunk the, everybody. Yes, that is the side that Dirk never had. Yeah. So, so the question really becomes, and, and this is really, these are conversations I love getting into. Dirk Nowitzki... What? <laughs> D- Dirk Nowitzki, the question is, 
So if you have Dirk and you have and, and Porzingis, and let's say they both have generally around the same skill levels, one's more athletic than the other, how does that relate to their longevity in the league? Dirk didn't take a lot of body shots. Yeah. Didn't have to. Didn't his knees didn't have to deal with coming down from the basket. I over think and Porzingis over again. is a stronger. His body looks more ready to take on the NBA beating than Dirk's was when he came into the league. I think. But it's the repetition on I the joints. I think Kristaps is going to have to learn how to use his body more efficiently, not effectively, but efficiently. As, he's very physical right as now. As the years go on, and I think you know, defensively, he can continue to be the type of player that he is now. But offensively, he's got to work on the mid-game. Because what people the don't realize... The mid-range game, just like Kobe learned, just like Michael Jordan learned, just like LeBron is learning, yep. that mid-range game but he has is a where you can that's, save yourself. That's, he has a mid-range game. He just, he it's could, not as polished. Yeah, he could take that to an astronomical yes, level yes. if he wants to, because he's 7'3". Yes. Now, the thing that interests me about him is that people always go, oh, well, you know, LeBron... You know, does this or or Westbrook? They're athletes. They jump. They. Do. It's different when you're 270. Yeah. The beatings on your knees aren't the same. Yeah. That's why, when you go and look at a distance runner, they're not big. Yeah. Because if I ran distance the way that let's say these these Olympic distance runners run, my body would fall apart. Yeah, the big runners are the sprinters. Yeah, because, because what happens is they're not taking as much uh, beating, beating on, their, on their, joints their joints because 240 pounds is harder to move than 145 pounds. Yeah, that's why you see bigger NFL players than you do soccer players. Soccer players have to run a long yes, way. Yes, yes, and so that's why I'm saying it's interesting because if if Porzingis doesn't watch out, out there yeah, if Porzingis doesn't watch out, he'll have an amazing 12, I, I, 13 years. But if he doesn't Build that other game. It, it's going to be. I think the mid range game, and he, as you said, he's got the game there. It's just polishing it off and when not you have so many to tools. That's the thing on, that's interesting. On his inside game. When you have so many tools at your disposal, what is the saying? Jack of all trades, master of none. Yes. Dirk only had one or two trades, yes, which exactly, is. Exactly, and he mastered them. Yeah, and he mastered them. That's why he's lasted so long. Yeah. It's the turnaway fade yeah. and the follow up three point shot. Yeah. That's all he ever had. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he was tall enough he to... He could do other stuff, but... Every once in a while. Yeah, exactly. But when you sit there and go, I can shoot the three, I can shoot the two, I can dunk, I can back him in, I yeah. can do the hook shot. Why not try them all? Yeah, and you can't master all of yeah. them. Unless you're Kareem abdul I think what you do, or, like Dirk, you master a couple of them, and then you do the others when you need to. Mm -hmm. And I think he's going to only get better. Let's look at a couple of other teams. The Celtics, they've won 13 games in a row. <laughs> And this is impressive. They lost the first two games. We thought, ooh, that loss of Hayward is going to kill them. That's Everybody knock thought them that. Out. They're out. They're wow. done. Wow. I mean, it, I think, you know, they worked a lot together, Kyrie and, and Gordon Hayward, on how they were going to play together and everything. And losing him early, I mean, right away, basically, uh, Kyrie was like, ooh, I, I don't know what to do now. Because all we did during the preseason was work together and figure out how we were going to make this work. Now I've got to completely change the way that I play and the way this team is going to play because everything goes through him. Mm -hmm. Everything goes through him. Now, he has found a way to play with Jalen Brown. He's found a way to play with Marcus Smart. He's found a way to play with Horford and Tatum. It's working brilliantly right now. I don't know if they can Tatum keep it up. crazy Because right there's now. a lot of youth on this team. I don't know if they can keep it up for the entire season, but this is unbelievable. And Tatum, look at his numbers. He's, remember we talked about if he replaces Jay Crowder in his rookie year, that'll be awesome because basically he's that, way more polished. He's a, has a better overall game. He's bigger. He's he's his PER is seventeen point two. Only 15, 15 games in, he's averaging fourteen six and one and a half. Seventeen point two PER. Crowder's PER for our entire last year was only a fifteen. Was under a fifteen. So he's already better than Crowder was. So here's here's the interesting part to me. Is this a is this a Kyrie growing up, or is this a is this a shameful shameful take on how bad the city of Cleveland is for sport? Because remember how horrible that Cleveland team was until LeBron came. Yeah. But the only reason why they did well is because love came LeBron and Kyrie. Then they brought Jr. Yeah. And then all all these all pieces came to All these other guys who to wanted him. to play with LeBron. But the teams that. That, that Cleveland as a city build fall apart. Yeah. 
Cleveland built, and there's already people saying that this one's falling apart. Yeah, but but it, but this was LeBron's team. That's why yeah. they're coming to play. But look at Kyrie's team by itself couldn't do anything, even yeah. though he was super talented. Cleveland Browns can't do ever do anything. <laughs> Cle, you the know, river Celtics, lights itself on fire every yeah, couple yeah, of years. The Celtics all of a sudden get Kyrie, well, they lose now, their number two option. Look at coaching. Cleveland history of co- coach head coaches not great. Boston history of head coaches, unbelievable. They've had the best head coaches sorry, in the history of the sport. But they would not, this, the guy that they brought in to be the head coach of, of uh, the Celtics was not this highly touted, everybody no. fought for him. Cleveland had just as much of an opportunity to hire him as the Celtics did. Yeah, but at it's Butler, just constant he was decisions. able to take a team with less talent and take them to the final but four. But I'm saying it's decisions. It's president, GM, owner They decisions. knew that he was going to be a great coach in the NBA. They could see it from Butler, his days at Butler. He but they was must going have been the be only people. Because, because no one uh, else fought for him. I'm just telling you that Boston and Danny Age has done a great job rebuilding this team after the Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, and Ray Allen uh, championship year. They knew, hey, this isn't going to work again. Cleveland did the exact opposite, right? They said, no, oh, th- th- we can make this work again. We'll just bring in some more older pieces. To make this work. And it, 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 it's not. Well, we'll bring in some older pieces. We'll go to Home Depot, buy some, buy, buy some duct tape and, exactly. and stuff to make sure that everything some falls apart. Some Loctite. It's, yeah. it's not working. <laughs> some, you can't some, just some, Loctite some WD-40 and yeah. and, uh, You so can't just you can't. oil, these, oil these, uh, these, um, th- these hinges on these, you know, Derek Rose and Dwayne Wade. Those guys. They'll give you one or two or maybe 10 or 15 games during the year that you're like, whoa, that's but here's an old thing. guy. If you had one of those guys, it'd be fine. But when you build a team of those guys, <laughs> that doesn't work. But you wait a minute. Have some young wait a minute. Wait a minute. The Mavs did that in 2011 and won. 2010. But yes. They won the, the 2011. 2010, 2011. Yeah. They won on old guys. They brought in Kidd, they had Terry, they had Dirk Nowitzki, they brought in uh, Matrix, they brought in um, well, they had Tyson, Tyson Chandler. Chandler. Those were all older guys. But there were a lot of younger parts, especially off the bench around them. Deshaun Stevenson wasn't... They, we're not talking about guys who were well over 30, though. We're talking about guys who were close, around But we were also talking about guys outside of Kidd, Terry, they and also Dirk weren't that all, didn't superstars. have... But they also didn't have a lot of tread... I mean, they didn't have a wear on their tires. They had a lot of tread left. You know, Kidd wasn't that, you know, explosive, get to the basket, take on everybody, duke everybody, scorer. That's why his career lasted so long. He was smart. He used his brain more than his body. Well, you see it now. He's a coach, a head coach, and he's a successful head coach in the league right now. Which is amazing. And he jumped right in. We got a scoop. Last, Last thing on the NBA we have is... Tonight, we've got the Lakers playing against the 76ers. Normally, we wouldn't talk about either of these teams uh, the last, ten, last five, ten years. But honestly, together, this makes for a very interesting matchup. Yes. I think it's very exciting to see two kind of, I, I don't know that the Lakers are up and coming based on what they have now, but on the knowledge that we believe that at least two superstars are going to be on that team next year, that's going to be an amazing team. And to see what talent will be around them, we, we, Look, they're going to be they're going to be good in the future. Yeah, this team's not bad right now. But look at Ball struggling, but he's almost averaging a triple double. Yeah. But the question is, how good is a triple double when your points are ten? Right. That's the real question. I I'm think, sorry, but a triple Jason, double when you're scoring ten. This is points. very Jason Kidd s though. Is that he doesn't need to score? And now Jason Kidd, be you know, really be careful that. with that as comparison. No, 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 no. Jason Kidd was not a scorer when he came in the league. I think he scored more than 10. No. He actually, his rookie year was less than 10 points. Okay. He was not a great scorer when he How came How many to assists did he but have? But that's where he made up for it was the fact that he could rebound and he was a great passer. He was a great runner of the offense. He was a great quarterback of the offense for the Mavericks when he came into the league. Lonzo Ball is doing the same things. Can he learn to shoot? I don't know. His shot is so... Because Jason Kidd at least had a decent-looking shot. He just couldn't make buckets. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was mental. Lonzo Ball has a horrible-looking shot. Can he, get it, can he fix it? And to think that Not father... Not during the season. That father want, now wants to take LaMelo out of school and teach him on his own. 
He taught he taught Lonzo how to shoot that way, and he let him shoot that way. Uh, it's, it, his his shot is horrific looking. It's it's almost like watching Sean. And Marion. he always has to go to the left. At least Sean Marion made shots. So look, but <laughs> Kuzma, Lopez, um, Ingram, th their bench, Ingram, their bench is is decent. Decent. They've they got are, good pieces. They're two pieces away. They're two pieces away, and if those superstars come next year, it's going to be an awesome team. But tonight. You're then looking against a you know Philadelphia 76ers team who is playing out of their minds right now, and Ben Simmons running the point because Markel Fultz is injured, mm -hmm. and you know Markel will probably end up seeing out the year, and it'll be you know a redshirt year just like Ben Simmons took, just like Joel Embiid uh, took. But that team is going to be loaded in the future. So I think you're talking about two teams, both on the rise in the NBA, yes. both all around 500, and with opportunities to grow. And it's going to be an exciting game. Both teams can score. Both teams are bad defensively. I think it's going to be a wild game. It's going to be a lot of fast break dunks. That's what we love to watch in the NBA. So I think it's an exciting well, game to, to watch tonight. The great thing about that is it's not the typical NBA, you know, 2015, 16, 17 NBA game where it's all run up the score, shoot the three. Run up the, run up the floor, shoot the three. Run up the floor, shoot the three. Run up the floor, fake, shoot the three. I mean, I like the fact that when you start having to defend dunk after dunk and layup and penetration, then the ball starts automatically and naturally flowing out to open people who are shooting a three. Then it starts getting exciting. I'm sorry. I, that is one of the things that frustrates me the most about Wes Matthews and James Harden. I don't think there's any skill, other than the fact that it is probably hard to shoot the percentages they do. I don't think there's any skill at all in the game of basketball, to run up and go, I'm a shooter, I'm going to run up, shoot the ball, run up, shoot the ball, run up, shoot the ball, run up, shoot the ball. And they don't even give anybody else a chance. Steph Curry is probably the only guy that can get away with it because he also can dribble. Yeah. Probably the best dribbler in the NBA. And he's, he's unselfish with the ball. But my gosh, it, does that not annoy you? They dribble. Well, I don't everybody see Wes Matthews in the same light that you see him in he, terms of you know, what he does I, with Harden. But see... Harden's a totally different player in my mind. But he also has the balls in the, ball in his hands. So what happens is, as I watch Harden go up, and if he doesn't think that he has a three or a Euro step into the lane, he gives the ball up at the last second so that someone can maybe shoot the ball. I don't like that. I look at it the same way. The only reason why Wesley Matthews is not the same as these other guys is because he doesn't have the ball in his hands all the time. Well, when he's you see, not as skilled either. Yeah, but you see Wesley Matthews run up, they hand on the ball. The second the ball touches his hand, it's going. Yeah. You see that with James Harden. You see that with I Westbrook. I think they, you they've see told that. him to just keep shooting, and they're hoping that he's going to shoot himself back into form, and I, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't with think this you Maverick can team. shoot yourself into a new I think Achilles he's got to go. He's got to go somewhere <laughs> where he's coming off the bench as a sixth or seventh man and where he's expected to literally just come on the floor and shoot threes. I, it's not going to happen with this Mavericks team. You mean team. he'll the be Mavericks like a, a Charlie Vill Villanueva? A, yeah, it's a little bit like that for sure. And remember, Charlie Villanueva is very frustrating when he was cold because he was ice cold, but he just kept launching up threes. we got to move on to college basketball. College basketball, there were two big games last night. Uh, and then we talked about Grayson Allen earlier. we got to talk about him because he had a huge night. Next. Hmm. Maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made her college years happen. Butcha. Opening that education savings account when she was little. Spearheading a campus tour. And another, and another, and another, and another. Bam! Deciphering financial aid. She was like, what? Well, now she's like, yeah! you waste planning for college. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. So college basketball hype was definitely on point. Michigan State versus Duke. Duke. Yeah, and they had Duke again, number one, and Michigan State n number two, and I had it reversed. But, I mean, this game was uh, legit. Both of these teams, they are number one and number two. Yeah, Bagley was someone who everybody thought best player on the, the, the Blue Devils team by far. And w w so number one player on the number one team in the country. Yes. To me, I thought Bridges was a better player. We didn't get to see last night that matchup because Bagley ended up going down with an eye injury. Got poked in the eye and had to sit. I, how do you get poked in the eye and you have to sit on the entire game? I don't know. I've been poked more in the eye a lot. Going so, on there. The real question is, is, is 
Grayson Allen worth it? He has been, you know, if he was worth He was the best player on the court last night, by the way. Grayson Allen was unbelievable. And he, his game. freshman year, best player on the court. Yeah. Last year, he had all that craziness that he, that he had going, the temper tantrums, the, the punching, the kicking, the all that tripping. stuff. The tripping. The tripping. If he, so my question is, is, was there not, what is the difference between last year and this year? What is the difference between freshman year, sophomore year? Was all that well, drama last now. year, was all that drama last year really not worth him getting drafted? He probably didn't go out because he thought his draft status was I agree. I think he, he was is he worth seeing the a drop. In it. I, he would have been a second round pick last year. And I think what he saw also was the talent that the Blue Devils were going to bring in this year was going to be so amazing that he thought, look, I'm not going to be a first round pick. On, on the team that he was on because mm -hmm. he was having to run the point, which he didn't want to run. He wanted to be a shooting guard. And now he gets to be that shooting guard. He, need, he gets to do the things that he wants to do on the court. So he believes that he'll be a better player doing the things that he wants to do on the court. He'll have a better chance of getting into the first round. And I also think that he thought, look, we got a better shot at winning a national championship this year. They're a Final Four contender for sure this year. Last year, there were big questions, and clearly, they didn't meet those. Well, let's, be, let's break it down and be honest about the game of college football. Oh, it's it's not, football. I'm sorry, college basketball. It's not supposed to be about the senior. It's yeah. not supposed to be about the senior. It's supposed to be about the one-and-done freshman yeah. that everybody wants in the NBA. Well, we got to see a but lot Grayson of last Allen, night. Allen, but Grayson Allen has always been able to find a way to make the story about himself. Whether it's drama, whether it's his skill on the court, he's always been able to do that. So in a league that is supposed to constantly promote its freshmen, do you think that they are going to be able to wrap their hands around possibly having the best player on that team being Grayson Allen and not this talented freshman? No, I think the talented freshman, whether he scores 20 a night or not, he's going to be a top five pick in the draft. Uh, because they they know what he can do and his athleticism. But his, don't we know what Grayson Allen can do? And everything. I'm not sure that the NBA is as positive about what Grayson Allen can do in an NBA jersey. I, I you watch him play, it's crazy. Johnny Manziel, perfect example. Okay. Okay. Well, no, so no, no, no. So you well, could be a great college player in a sport. <sighs> But it doesn't always people, translate. I hate when people use Johnny Manziel because it, but it's wasn't, true. it wasn't his talent on the field that got him out. It was his drinking. No, but he, he also he never got a was chance. not talented enough. He, we do not know that. He, did you not read what We're happened during the, play. Okay. But during the time he wasn't three. reading, he wasn't reading the playbooks. Robert Griffin III. Okay, that is a better example. Okay, he had one the great year, but there, then it was but his just... Body, with him, his body couldn't hold up. But I'm just saying that it doesn't always translate, and yeah. that's why they look at body. They look at size. They okay. look at a capability but Ingram, to do certain things. I wouldn't translate and put Ingram... I mean, I wouldn't put Grayson Allen against RG3. If I was going to compare RG3, I'd do Ingram from the Lakers. Yeah, and I think right. that's, that's a legit, because Ingram, he was the best player on that team last year at Duke, and... They didn't win. Yeah. And so there were concerns about can he, can he yep. win. Also, there were concerns body about his it. body size. He just, so he's a stick. I think you're, he can score in the league. I think your comparison between Johnny Manziel and Grayson Allen are appropriate. They both have that attitude. Yeah. But I cannot put up with the people saying Johnny Manziel couldn't make it in the league. He played three games. Three of them, he was drinking and doing substance abuse so bad, he didn't know the plays. He didn't study. He didn't do anything. That wasn't his physical ability. He could have been the next Russell Wilson, but, but think better you gotta, arm. you got to take everything into okay, account. Okay, but Grayson Allen is not that kind of a player. But what they're saying is, do problem. they want to deal with those attitude problems? Okay, they so don't they're know. judging. Yeah, and okay. I think even if he scores 30 a night this year and Duke wins the championship, okay. he's still, talent-wise, what NBA is looking for. This is why Giannis Antetokounmpo was drafted 15th. The problem is they're looking for specific things, and players get miss, they get looked over because of certain things. Then you get guys that drafted number one who don't end up being anything because, look, some of these guys, they get drafted because you can't teach size. Yes. Can't right? teach speed. But then if the guy can't put the ball in the bucket, what does it matter how tall he is? So, so there's, there's certain things that they're looking for, and they're not always right. 
But Grayson Allen is one of those guys who doesn't match up to the things that NBA scouts are looking for. So I'm going to ask the question again. Remember J.J. Redick? Yes. Okay, so J.J. Redick was a monster scorer in college basketball. Came into the league. He got drafted late because he, he's only six foot or six foot one or whatever. Bigger, better example is And Jimmer he's a shooting Verdette. guard. He couldn't guard anybody. Bigger, Jim, Jimmer Verdette is a better example. Okay. But Grayson Allen is a physical athlete. He has the explosive. He has the skills. He has the handle. So... My question to you again is... I, I think of him the, more with, as Ginobili. Okay. I think he can shoot from the outside. He can take the ball to the basket. He's skilled yes. around the basket. He knows how to get the ball into the basket. Ginobili is a great example. Okay. Drafted late. Everybody thought, a little bit well, more athletic, he just doesn't yes. have as much athleticism as some of these other guys. He doesn't have the height. He doesn't have the reach. Things like that that NBA scouts are now really looking for. Somebody is going to get a steal late in the first round or early in the second round. With so just, just a short answer to this, because I will ask the question again. He has proven, Grayson Allen has proven, that he is the man when it comes to big games. He doesn't shy yeah. away from them. And at times, he could be the sports or the league's biggest lead actor, right? You know, he demands yes. the spotlight when he's on. Sometimes he can be the hero... But most of the times, he's the villain. He was the hero against Michigan State for Duke, but he was the well, villain. Well, he had to be, right? Because Bagley goes down, and he assumes that Do spotlight role. Do you think role. that the NCAA as a whole can embrace having one of the best players being someone like Grayson I don't think Allen? they have to. I think that's one thing about college basketball that's totally different than college football. Um, college football has to embrace Nick Saban. They have no, to. What I mean by embrace because is... I understand, think, I understand what okay. you're saying. But they don't have to. They can say, look at all these amazing players that we have. Grayson Allen is doing great on Duke. Duke has to embrace Grayson Allen. Okay. The NBA will have to embrace Grayson Allen. But college basketball does it because there's so much else going on in college basketball. All right, let's... There's all these other great players. There's going to be 10 picks in this draft that are going to be all-stars two years from now. Well, we've been saying I'm, that a lot. No, I'm saying it. Factually, there are 10 players in this draft that two years from the draft, well, it's not now, from 60 this next draft. 60% of the time, you're right years, every time. They're going to be all-stars. Right? I, I'm putting it, okay. it's on stone, it's recorded. Okay. I said it now. Kansas beat Kentucky. I, great win for Kansas. It, look, they had seven, I keep saying look, I hate that, right? <laughs> they had seven guys on scholarship that were available for this game. Uh, two guys who are not scholarship players available, but the, you know those guys are only going to play if you're winning by a lot or losing by a lot. Seven guys, scholarship players, played in this game. They beat a Kentucky team that's extremely athletic, can score the ball. Kevin Knox. So an average, normal Kentucky team. Yeah, and Kansas showed why Bill Self is an amazing coach. Well, Kansas kept Kentucky to... A 42% shooting from the field, and they caused them 18 turnovers. You can't overcome 18 turnovers, Kentucky's especially if be the like that. The problem Kentucky is going to face throughout the rest of the season is, can they defend after they turn the ball over? Because they cannot give up fast break points. That's the way they're going to lose. Because they can shoot the ball. The problem is that they are very loose with the ball. They, they're not great passers. They've got a lot of guys who are, you know, one and done, who are all about me, who are trying to score every time, and don't make good, good decisions. So there's, there's a problem in Kentucky. In Kansas, the problem is, is they don't have a bunch of great athletes. They have some very good athletes. They've got to play within Bill Self's system. If they don't play within Bill Self's system, they're, they're in trouble. But if they continue to play like that against everybody else, they're going to be a Final Four. Okay, let's, final, let's finally end this thing up. We're going to talk about the State Farm Champions Classic. The league and the NCAA has plans for this. What are those plans? To be the opening night of college basketball. And I think it's a great idea because, honestly, look at the opening weekend. We, we looked at the games. We looked at the schedule. We said, wow, there's a bunch of great teams playing. But who are they playing against? Nobody. They play nobody. So it's like a mini Dude tournament playing to like start. playing like Elon. It like, who cares? Let... Let's start the college basketball season off with a, with a tournament. bang. With a little tournament. Yes, these yeah. little tournaments, phenomenal way to start the season it's off. It's a big revenue generator you for the NCAA. You get the best teams on. Yeah, it's a great, because of the TV uh, spotlight that they get, it's a great 
generator for revenue for the NCAA. It could be a and little, a little March Madness before way, March Madness. Yes, it's a great way for these teams to get that excitement, that energy. The the players just are on the spotlight, so ready to go for the season. It's great for these top teams. Yeah. They need that early on because honestly, right after this tournament's over, they're going to go back to playing sleepers for another you know uh, month until they get into their their uh, conference schedule and start actually playing anybody. Some of these conferences aren't any good. Michigan State's not really going to play anybody. Yeah. Indiana lost to, like, Northern Iowa or something. I Ohio mean, State, nobody. Michigan. So, those no, are bas- Indiana lost to Indiana State. Well, what so I'm saying Blake is Bird even the very big happy. Power 5 schools in basketball are not Power 5 schools. No, They're no, not it's, huge. it's very different. Michigan is not the same. Ohio, Ohio State, State is no. not the same. Penn State, Purdue, those are not huge basketball powerhouses. They're football powerhouses. No, so you, you see it's very different. The SEC is actually going to be very strong, so you're going to see a bit of a comparison of SEC football versus SEC basketball. But you're always going to see it as long as Kentucky's playing. Georgia, Missouri, Missouri has Michael Porter Jr., so they're going to be a watchable team when he gets healthy. I think there's a lot of great college basketball this season. I think we're going to have to wait a little while, though, for most okay. of it. But March Madness is going to be awesome. I'm, I'm excited already. And we've got, what, six months to go? <laughs> I'm going to run out of steam on the college basketball season before we get there. So tomorrow when we uh, come back, we will be diving headfirst into Thursday Night Football. Yes. Recapping everything that's happened we've this week. We've got Matt Wixon week. and Matt Tyler coming Kern in. coming in tomorrow. It's going to be action-packed. See you tomorrow. This is Off the Bench.